Yep. All right, so we're live, Amber. Sounds good. All right, everyone, welcome. We're so glad to have you here with us tonight for our Rising Up for Dignity film series first discussion event. I'm Ruth Ann Butler and I'm the media events coordinator for the Never Again Coalition. And on behalf of Never Again and all of our partners, I'd like to welcome you very warmly this evening. Our partners include World Oregon, Portland State University's Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project, Amnesty International USA Group 48, and the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I also wanna mention that this event is also part of a larger event called C by C Amplified. It's an ideas summit presented by World Affairs Councils nationwide. This week, councils from around the US are working together to highlight the power of their amazing network. So we encourage everyone who's joining us today to please support your local World Affairs Council. We also wanna thank um, the Action for Sama campaign that has been working with us to allow us to coordinate with their efforts for advocacy and action uh, around this film and acknowledge PBS Frontline, which is the US distributor for, for Sama. Registration for this series is ongoing. We'll be meeting next Thursday, the 14th for a discussion around the film, I Am, a Ro I Am Rohingya, A Genocide in Four Acts. And on the 21st of May, we'll be meeting again for discussion around the film Sema. And registration will be ongoing through the whole series. So please feel free to share it if you feel that others that you know would, would enjoy this or benefit from it. I just wanna give a brief introduction to our Rising Up for Human Dignity film series. Um, the stories that we're offering you this month are from incredibly diverse perspectives and diverse locations around the globe. And I just wanna explain a little bit about why we selected these three films and why we think they're so important. We've picked these particular films because each one is told through the lens of artists and performers that are bringing their own experiences to light through their art. And each one also opens a window into the ongoing violence and oppression that is continuing in Syria and Burma and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Although these conflicts are relatively well known to the global public, they continue with impunity for the perpetrators and often they're framed in abstractions and ways that sometimes even contribute to dehumanization. In contrast, these films really invite us to enter into personal lived experience. And in doing so, we are asked both to confront the realities of conflict and also have the opportunities to find within ourselves the capacity for connection and compassion. Through these films, we're able to witness the beautiful ways and profound ways that life rises up, even in the face of horrible oppression and the ways that when we're confronted with personal and collective tragedies, our capacity to share our stories can allow us to restore meaning and connection. What brings us together tonight is witnessing and experiencing and being moved by Forsama, which is a powerful expression of human dignity and love that director Wad Al-Khatib made for her daughter Sama and has also shared with us and shared with the world. This evening we'll have about half an hour for discussion with our moderated panel and you'll meet all of our speakers in a few moments. And then we'll open to questions. We have Tim DeRoche, Director of Programs at World Oregon who will be bringing the questions to the panel. And I'd also like to introduce our panel moderator who is Dr. Amanda Byron. She is the Director of Portland State University's Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project. And she's a social justice educator with over 30 years of experience working with diverse communities to heal trauma and transform conflict. And her current teaching and research interests include so many things that are relevant to tonight's conversation and I wanna share them with you. Uh, among other things, they include a focus on unsettling the role of identity in conflict, understanding and mythification, and hatred as root causes of violence, developing peace building strategies to effectively address ethno-religious conflict, creativity as a conflict resolution practice, and the restoration of dignity in the aftermath of atrocity. So many, many interesting themes that I'm sure we'll interweave in our conversation tonight. We're also very privileged to have a message from the director Wad Al-Khatib that she's recorded to share with us. We invited her to come tonight, but she wasn't able to do so due to the time difference with London. So we will we'll share her message with you now and then Amanda can take over and we'll meet our panelists for tonight and get into our conversation. Hello everyone. 
everyone. Uh, my name is Ward Khatib, and I'm a Syrian filmmaker. And also, I'm an activist. Uh, my film for Sama was uh, made during five years of the uh, revolution in Syria, Aleppo, and it showed just the reality of our life there and some of the crimes that was committed by the Syrian regime and Russian force forces. Um, I'm so happy today that Forsam was chosen to be part of the uh, Raising Up for Human Dignity film series. And um, thank you so much for the uh, Never Again Coalition for inviting me to be part of this. And at the same time, I'm very sorry that I can't be there, um, but for once the time difference is too much. Uh, and for a mom of two little daughters working from home, it's really like disaster what's happening now. Uh, but at the same time, like I'm really uh, glad that this conversation is happening and um, like this great panel discussion today will keep uh, telling people about what's happening in Syria until today and demand accountability. Um, I'm just still hoping that one day we could find uh, the justice that we are seeking uh, for every day uh, since 2011 when the Syrian revolution started until today. Uh, my experience in Syria was um, so mixed between being uh, the female filmmaker and, and the mom at the same time. And both these roles were having so much challenging, totally different from each other, but also at the same time. It was just being faced like the same community and the same fears a minute by a minute that I will lose myself or I will lose my daughter or my husband. And um, to be one of that community, uh, like trying to carry that hope every day to keep going and keep finding um, a reason for what you are working uh, on and how you need to keep your camera being recorded every second and at the same time you feel that struggle between you and yourself that maybe this is, will not change anything. Um, at the same time um, there is part of the community where they are really not uh, respect or um, appreciate or even like recognize how important is it to document and to um, like save all these four crimes from one point of view which I totally understand because sometimes I was feeling the same and that's minutes while I was behind the camera and while I'm like filming a boy who's um, like almost almost dying or the very bad injured uh, patient in the hospital I was always like asking myself why I'm doing this is it really will change something uh, or is it just will be an, another clip will be in my um, archive and that's what people there think about what we were doing as filmmakers and as a mom also uh, to see my daughter growing up in front of my eyes and feeling sometimes very hopeless that I can do something to protect her but also I need to try to keep going and try create that hope to look around me and see the other kids uh, who is living there or the other families and smile and pretend that everything would be fine and we just need to do what we really believe in. Uh, the decision about staying there or leaving, it was something we've never uh, were uh, like thinking right about that. The only thing we wanted as uh, like Syrian people to stay at like in our houses and in our country, uh, trying to um, fight for our rights and freedom and dignity. And that's what the Syrian revolution, um, that's why the Syrian revolution started in 2011. And that's why we were trying to keep that belief in ourselves all the time that whatever the price was now, but we, this is all will be for a free country. Um, the last crime happened in front of our eyes before we leave Syria was the displacement. Um, and for so many people, they were like really happy that we are uh, like safe. And we felt that too. But at the same time, there was something we could never forget that we were forced to flee out of our uh, country and we were pushed 
to leave our homes and our uh, like cities. And that wasn't happening just in Aleppo, that happened also in another uh, four cities at least. That's what we hope one day we could have from accountability and when justice will happen is really to put account, to put uh, every person who committed any crimes in Syria under accountability. Uh, after Forsama was released and with the amazing reaction and response from the people all over the world, we created an impact campaign called Action Forsama and we were just trying to like gather all the amazing response and the anger that people feel sometimes, the sadness that they feel and the hopeless they like could feel after watching the film um, and some other people who felt like strength and they felt so strongly that they want to do something to Syria and that's why Action for Summer started. Uh, so please like join us in this and check Action for Summer on social media and our, in our website. Um, like we can do everything, but we can do just a very simple steps uh, where it could help someone in Syria or it could push more for accountability or uh, like put uh, the governments all over the world under more pressure to do something and to act. Uh, to change and end the suffering of the Syrian people. Uh, thank you so much again, and um, I wish everyone of you will stay safe. Um, and um, sorry again for not being with you. Um, and thank you so much all. Great, well, let's go ahead and get started. I wanna introduce our panelists and thank everyone for being here tonight to have this important conversation. We have Dr. Hisham Bismar, who's an orthopedic surgeon who grew up in Damascus, um, but has lived in the United States for the past 30 years. He regularly travels to the Middle East on medical missions. And um, he, is, he now lives in Portland, Oregon, where he's the president of the Northwest chapter of uh, the Syrian American Medical Society. We have Nora Sheikh Ayob, who's a Syrian activist and agricultural engineer with over seven years of experience working in the humanitarian field. Uh, she focuses on women's empowerment and political participation. And we also have Elias Matar, who was born in Syria but has lived in the United States through uh, most of his adult life. He's a longstanding filmmaker who has documented the refugee journey out of Syria and is currently working in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon through his nonprofit, The Lighthouse Peace Initiative. So thank you all for being part of this conversation. And as we just heard, the film for Sama was um, meant to galvanize participation and concern, both concern about what's happening in Syria and participation in trying to create change and support the struggle that's happening there. So maybe as a starting point, you could start off by um, talking about your own relationship to the struggle in Syria and your reflections on the film, how it may have um, represented the need for action, how the storytelling that was present in the movie um, either mirrors or um, differs from your own stories. Who would like to go first? Go ahead, Nora. Nora. Yeah. Okay. Um, talking about Syria, I um, the revolution started 2011, and even before that, uh, we faced like uh, many problems in Syria as a Syrians because we used to live in Syria. For me, I used to live in Syria all my life. Um, but we faced a lot of problems, political problems, uh, even um, economical problems, uh, but a lot of things related to the security, to the intelligence, uh, that the president used to control everything, even the, the, uh, like uh, court systems, the, the money, uh, the economy, the, the teaching system, everything was under control by that regime regime so uh, it was like so hard for many people to be um, 
or to, to live normal life as others like in other countries. We, we wanted to be free. We wanted to, uh, to say what uh, the wrong things that we saw. Um, for me, like um, I came from two different uh, ethnicity. My father was uh, Kurdish and my mom uh, is Arab. And just because of that, not just because of that, and also my father was communist and it wasn't accepted uh, for the regime back in Syria. So we, we, like, we saw my father arrested when I, like, I first time saw my father arrested when I was six years old. Uh, I remember that they came after the middle of the night and they took my father, the intelligence, just because he's communist and because of the reports and because of his uh, activism. Then after that, we start recognizing that there is like, uh, there is many uh, ethnicities living in that country, but also at the same time, the regime like tried hardly to divide those people, to divide cities also, like uh, try to make kind of sensitive uh, situation between cities next to each other, to, to make also sensitive situations between uh, different ethnicities. Uh, I faced that, I was, um, eight or nine years old when I heard that like you should not play with this girl because she is Kurdish and someone else say that like you should not play with that girl because she is not Kurdish. It was like uh, for a kid it was something really strange but the regime tried hardly to, to, to teach people how they live that fear every day. Uh, we wanted to break that fear and that's why the revolution started in 2011 as uh, Revolutions start in different countries, also in other countries, in other Arab countries. Uh, in Syria, the situation was totally different because there is uh, that, like, there is no majority actually in the country because either uh, when we are talking ethnics, there is Arabs, Kurds, uh, Assyrian, Chechenian, Kildanians, like uh, Iranians, a lot of like different. Uh, uh, groups and also at the same time related to the religion. There was uh, uh, like uh, Muslims, uh, there was uh, by like even inside like Muslims, there is uh, Shia, Alawi, Sunnah, uh, Ismailis, uh, there was also Druze, there was Christians and also different uh, groups. So it was like so hard to, to decide where you will go. And the regime played on that and play in, played also in different uh, ways by opening the jails for thieves and robbers and uh, killers to, to, to get out, to make empty space for the political uh, arrested in Syria. And it was really breaking hearts uh, seeing that because there was a lot of kids, teenagers, uh, old people, women, uh, who they were arrested in really bad uh, circumstances. Uh, uh, many of them were like arrested in a small room. It's like two, two meters, two meters uh, for like over than like four years. Uh, they were lonely in those rooms or like same room included over than 50 people who they used to some of them stand to allow to others to sleep. The circumstances in jails were really bad for political uh, arrested. Uh, so by 2000, uh, by the end of 2012, the, the situation in Syria start like uh, shifting to became more as a war, as a civil war. Uh, other countries start uh, engaging more in this uh, situation. Uh, they start supporting either regime by uh, like talking about Russia, Iran, China and other small countries. Other countries decided to, to support different uh, like uh, groups back in Syria. And that's why we see the situation that we arrived to today. Uh, it's not easy to leave like country, like your country. For me, I left Syria by the beginning of 2013 and my, my heart was broken. But my mom and my sisters decided to not leave Syria if I didn't leave. So I was like, either they will be killed because of the, the airstrikes and shelling, or I have to live with them. So I, I will lose something. And the only way uh, that like, I was really engaged in that country and I had the, the way to go back again inside all the time was about working for the humanitarian sector. So I decided to work for uh, 
uh, NGOs and I used to go back to Syria all the time whenever I had a chance to do that. Uh, mostly I did that uh, three or four times per year, uh, sometimes more than, more than that. Uh, last time I entered Syria by 2018 and it was so hard for me to, to go inside because it wasn't, there was no legal road, uh, road to, to go inside. There was no legal borders, so I had to smuggle myself with one of my friends who knows the, the way to go and back. So we used to smuggle and we used to be arrested by Turkish uh, gendarme. Then also when we wanted to go back to Turkey, we did the same thing. And it was so hard to, to, to smuggle and to, to, to do that uh, and legally to go back to your country to do some work, but also at the same time to smuggle because it's not allowed to you to go back to your country. Uh, yeah, to do that. Like it took a lot of dedication to, to, to go back and to do the humanitarian work that you were involved in. So thank you. Well, we're going to come back to that because we want to look at what the, what the opportunities are for involvement at this point and how we keep our, keep our eyes on what's going on in that part of the world. So thank you very much for your introduction and the hard work that you've been engaged in. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Hisham, Bismar, would you like to go next? Yeah. Sure. So yeah, I grew up in Syria. I uh, left there in 85. I was just a teenager. Uh, you know, as most of teenagers, they are usually rebellious. I was uh, rebellious against the government. Uh, I also had issues with the society in general, and that's when I came to the U.S. Uh, I came to Dayton. Uh, I would say it was a bit of a disappointment uh, to come to Dayton uh, in the Midwest, but uh, I think it did um, help uh, highlight my sense of being Syrian over there. Uh, just because uh, the, uh, the, uh, the society around me did not really uh, react all that well uh, to somebody like me, somebody coming from the Middle East in the middle of the 80s. Uh, yeah, I started actually like Nora as an engineer and then later in life I switched to medicine um, because I wanted something uh, more interactive and more live. Uh, so I always wanted to do some humanitarian work, uh, and then um, the issue, uh, the uprising in Syria started in 2011. As it started unfolding, uh, I remember uh, I was becoming very frustrated. To me, it felt it's the same way that it, it always happened in, in previous conflicts. Uh, I remember specifically the conflict in Bosnia. Uh, at that time, uh, in the early 90s, I was uh, becoming very um, irritable. My friends really did not really grasp, my American friends uh, did not grasp why I was so uh, involved in it. In Bosnia, to me, kind of hit home. It's, it's similar to Syria. You have uh, multi-ethnicities, you have uh, multi-religious communities, and uh, it seemed like they were all living uh, together in harmony. And it really upset me when uh, basically uh, whatever, you know, ruling class tried to use these uh, uh, ethnic lines or religious lines to, to basically divide the society. And then I thought the world should have uh, tried to uh, react to that in a, in a better way. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, they did not. And then Srebrenica happened, and you know the the conflict basically uh, spiraled down. Uh, when the Syrian conflict started happening, I, I thought exactly the same thing is going to happen uh, if the world did not uh, react to it, if uh, they did not uh, raise the issues that there were a lot of atrocities being committed at that time. And I would say I became very disappointed. One of the things uh, I tried to channel my frustration is uh, when I started actually going down to the Middle East uh, uh, to, to work with the refugees. Uh, initially, I went down to the uh, Turkish-Syrian Turkish, um, uh, Turkish -Syrian border in Rehanli, uh, started working over there. I have been going uh, once or twice a year since then. I went to Jordan. Uh, I thought that would be a way for me to kind of uh, pay my debt to the society where, where I was raised uh, in Syria. 
but I would say um, in, in the, the movie uh, for Sama uh, presents a really realistic view of what happened in Syria. And uh, also sometimes what, what, uh, what actually I seen over there sometimes uh, the, the patients, the injuries which uh, the patients came in. The, the kids uh, with, with almost full body burns, uh, multiple uh, wounds is sometimes worse than actually what uh, you might see in, in the movie. Uh, the other thing which I actually wanted to point is beside uh, what people see in, in, in the movies about the physical trauma, the one thing which a lot of times people sometimes overlook is the emotional or the psychological trauma uh, to, to the victims, particularly kids, uh, that actually affected me more than anything else. So I hope actually um, with this conflict actually now uh, starting to kind of like almost burn itself that we use this conflict to again try to prevent uh, these type of issues coming again in the world. The, the, I think the world has a responsibility when they see a conflict starting to spiral down that they actually need to interfere. They need to start exerting pressure on those people who are perpetrating these atrocities uh, to try to stop it, you know, like in Darfur or in, in Burma or in Bosnia. That, that seems to me that it's, it's not a lesson which uh, the world learns. We end up paying quite a bit uh, as a result of, of the inaction of the world. Thank you, yes. So these are exactly the kinds of questions that we're wanting to face and looking toward action. And there's, um, we'll point you toward them at the end, but on the Never Again Coalition um, website, there are some specific steps that people can take and, um, and, and so we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Thank you so much for your introduction. Um, Elias, tell us a little bit about your reflections. I'm so thrilled with the conversation. I didn't want to even talk, I just want to listen. <laughs> um, okay, so I was born, just a correction, I was born actually in California, but I lived in Syria for 15 years, um, mainly Damascus and then Latakia. And I, you know, my, the Syria and me, it's really not, uh, it's not in the buildings and the cities, it's more in the, my own memories of my childhood memories and the people themselves, because I think the Syrian people are very special to me uh, in this world because I feel that they carry such an old civilization. We are old religions. We lived in such a harmony among so many different tribes and there's something really special about Syria always been and for me personally as an artist you know i share with both of you i actually all, most of syrian kids end up going to engineering school anyway <laughs> you know <laughs> it's not it's not sorry about that it's not about the you know uh, but i didn't obviously i didn't stay in, i didn't go to medicine and you know but um syria to me is a dream syria to me was so beautiful as a kid like walking on the cobblestone streets in damascus and going to, I, I think I must have been eight years old when I took public transportation. I mean, it, it's, to me, it's just, that's what I love about Syria. My own memories with my family and my big tribe. Um, and it's uh, to, to go, you know, and I, you know, I came back, I came back to Indiana, by the way. So very close to where you went to school. So yes. I'm, a little, I'm a little older than I'm sure you, you enjoyed it. <laughs> it was amazing. You know, not really, but um, it, 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 it's really funny because in Syria, I was a minority and then I came to the States and I was a minority. So it was this sort of like a strange thing for me to live with that reality that that would be my, that would be my reality for the rest of my life. So I had this almost self-hating part of myself, right? And um, I went back to Syria a couple of times and I left in 1981, which is the first first incidents would happen. And I lost a lot of friends back then. And I, I never really had made peace with Syria and, and the people without talking about politics. For me, I never made peace with Syria. And I went back many times and 
my last trip to Syria, you know, um, I end up anyway going to jail. And then, um, and I never went back till I had kids and up 16 years later. And the reason why I wanted to go back is I just, my ex-wife and my two kids wanted to see Syria. So I want, I feel, I feel really obliged to do it. And I took my family there and I, that feeling of belonging was just so inside of me, but I really struggled with the situation and the injustice for me personally. And I'm not talking about political, I'm just talking about it as an individual. And flash forward to, 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 to you know, uh, when the whole crisis started a revolution, depends, you know, how you look at it. For me, it is like the call for change that was really powerful for me. And I really start, like, I wanted to be involved. And um, I remember, you know, I did a lot of, I used to be a long distance runner, so I would dedicate these runs for Syria for peace in Syria, for change for Syria. And not till 2014, uh, 2015, when I saw uh, on the news that there is this smuggler who left uh, 70, 70 people in a container on the side of the road in, uh, in Vienna or Austria, and they died suffocated to death. And there were Syrians that were trying, and then I studied like, what the international community can do, we're talking about individual, not countries, can go out there and show up and then be witness. That's why documentaries are so important because in that, you know, people can change the history. We know it. We see it today, people change in the history, but the documentaries are there to document the truth, right? And that's why I love this movie because she documented something that you cannot lie about because you could see it you can read it and that's why this this particular documentary i love what she did i'm a huge fan of her what she did for her life her family's life online to tell a story that was powerful but anyway so my involvement you know to connect to this story so my involvement began in in europe at the beginning where the refugees were walking same thing in greece same thing in turkey in march of 2016 those borders were closed solidified and the refugees were stuck in the countries they were in, like in Syria, Jordan, Turkey. And then I felt the need to move on to, to Lebanon because there's like two and a half million Syrian refugees living beyond, like nobody knew anything about them. And um, ironic that the same time she was actually in Aleppo, in the last, she's talking about her exodus out of Aleppo, I was actually in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon. And we saw a huge influx of youth and young people from Aleppo at that time. Amanda, I remember I talked to you about that um, when I came to show one of my films there. And it was really what, she said, what you're talking about, uh, doctor, about how the trauma these kids have, the adults, like it was, it's just mind blowing, right? Especially the kids themselves. And to talk to Noor specifically of call to action, what my fear is today is not the, about the one who made it to Europe. It's not about the one who made it to died. I mean, of course, we feel sorry. And I'm not sounding arrogant. I feel sorry for every soul that was lost in that conflict. But the ones who were left behind, the millions who were left behind that nobody talks about. Lebanon has over 2 million. Jordan has a million. Turkey has 4 million. Uh, Egypt has half a million. Iraq... We're talking about Syrian people living as, as refugees all over the world and subhuman uh, conditions, you know, like it's, it's and, and now it's been what, eight years now, what, nine years, we're approaching nine years, right? Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Right. The number of youth that were born after the war and the youth that were kids and now they're adults with no future, that's what terrifies me. This is why I call everybody to action. We need to engage the youth of the Middle East, the Syrian youth in all these different camps because otherwise they are going to, you know what they're going to happen to them. You know, they're either going to throw into, like the girls into 14 year old getting married or the boys are working labor when they're 10, 12 years old or, or worse than that, being involved in the dark world. You know what I mean? And this is what, you know, Amanda and I, we talk about is we need to do something for the youth. And that's what I formed my organization. Through art, we give them some sort of healing. You know what I mean? Because I don't believe, I, I don't trust any politicians in any country. They have turned their backs on, our, on all kinds of people, especially on the Syrian people. So, 
this is a great this is a great moment to pivot. So I'm going to jump in, Elias, and just to say that um, these are very diverse perspectives of your relationship and work in Syria. And the two questions that we're really left with here in the time that we have is to think about how we um, how we galvanize change. And each of you touched upon that in different ways of like what's needed to try and create change and and um, make a difference. And from this point moving forward. But another issue that I really want to pose to you is how we um, how we keep the struggle of Syrians, as Elias so eloquently just described the Syrian youth, millions of Syrian people who are sort of in limbo in refugee camps. How do we keep that uh, the international news story or attention on this struggle? Because oftentimes when something happens like nine years ago, it was in the news now it's not so much being brought in front of people's um, eyes and so people are not continuing to focus on the implications and the consequences of those nine years of um, struggle so how do we bring that into the consciousness of people who are willing to take action towards change and what action towards change is necessary at this point so i'd love for each of you to jump in and talk a little bit about that we've got about um 10 or 15 minutes uh, before Tim is going to bring in some questions. And so maybe each of you could take a couple of minutes and address those two issues. How do we bring uh, the international attention to the continued struggle? And what are some mechanisms, Elias mentioned the arts, what are some other ways to galvanize that transformation and change? Nora, <laughs> want to start? Okay. The problem, the problem is um, like uh, taking the, the attention of uh, like uh, like uh, globally. It's not easy because uh, after nine years, there is a new crisis and new problems uh, already start to, like uh, showing on the top. So like it's so hard to 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 like take the attention all the time. Uh, but I can say from the beginning uh, that the political uh, side of each country had really huge uh, like uh, information about what's happening in Syria. But when we talk about civilians in those countries, they don't know anything. Uh, when we talk about uh, refugees, for example, uh, everyone wanted to help, but everyone was shocked also at the same time when they start getting refugees because they didn't have really a clear idea about what's happening. Um, so it's uh, really hard to, to do that. Uh, but many people, like I, I don't want to call them people, but like either NGOs or civilians or uh, journalists or um, uh, doctors, like almost everyone can do something to try to do that. Uh, journalist is not enough because also people, they don't watch uh, really enough news. Uh, I noticed like uh, I moved to Canada recently and I noticed that most of my friends, they don't uh, watch the, the international news. They focus only about the, the, the local news. So making movies, it's something can make people uh, see that, but also the advertisement for this movie to make it really like um, uh, reachable for everyone or make it like free or also make the idea about it, uh, take the attention of everyone. It's something kind of hard and that the thing that we have to work on. An example, 2000, um, uh, 2016, the White Helmets uh, had, had uh, they had a movie and the, the movie win the Oscar, but uh, because they didn't make the right campaign uh, to raise that movie uh, enough and to make it reachable for everyone, it didn't get the same uh, like interaction uh, that uh, for Sama got. Just because White was more active and she tried to reach everyone uh, by even doing small campaigns or big campaigns, she tried to, to reach many people. Uh, for the, the white helmets, they didn't do that uh, in the same way, so they didn't reach same uh, like uh, amount of civilians in other countries. By that time, if that movie had the same action, I believe that uh, the situation now, like at least politically, 
could be different a little bit. Uh, yeah. I, I, Nora, I appreciate what you're saying about the films and I trust me, I've watched every single movie, you know, that came from Syria about the Syrian struggle. And it's really important to tell the stories. I think for, for me, my, from my perspective is I feel that the world have sort of somehow not interested in the Syrian crisis anymore. So it's almost up to us as humanitarian, not just Syrian, but humanitarian people to decision to make a difference. Like for example, I've made three documentaries. By the way, my second film, Exodus, is available on Star, uh, cable television, if you guys have stars. It's free, anybody could watch it. Just Exodus and my name and you'll find it. Children of Bekaa, the one I shot in Lebanon, is available on YouTube for free for everybody to watch it. And Amanda knows, I've spoken in front of thousands of people, and it's not about how big the film is, is the work you said, you're right, but how willing you are to engage the people in what they could do. The reason why I talk about just for me, what I feel the only way to really go beyond this is to engage the youth of the, the, the refugee youth to engage them somehow. That's what we need to do today. Okay, the war has happened. The crimes are there, okay? Like I said, I don't believe in politicians, but the crimes are there. They're there and they're witness and they're buried, they're, how do I say this? They're documented. We know what happened, okay? The world knows what happened. They choose to ignore it. That's up to the world, right? But what I feel we need to do is engage the youth of the Syrian refugee youth in all the different countries. I'm just making one example in Lebanon. We made, I made with them two short films, which Amanda is gonna show whenever this crisis is over. Brilliant film, written by them, performed by them. I directed the first one because they didn't know the second one they co-directed. We shot it together. I'm going back to Lebanon whenever this thing over, and we're actually making a commercial film together. It's nothing to do with the crisis, actually a horror film, but it's in Arabic, written by us, performed by us, and it has a commercial value. Because I feel for me that we need to step into that space in the world and say, you know, we are not just the refugees, we are human beings, we are capable, we are beings. You know, the, the thing that I, one of the major things that I, that I always work on my sets with the, with the, with the young film, filmmakers is listen to your female counterparts because they have a different perspective. Don't just ignore it and say whatever. So we, we, in, we, we work from like how to deal with all aspects. Because remember, a lot of the, a lot of the, the ones who lived in the camps in, in Lebanon at this moment are from the rural areas. You know what I mean? Like from uh, Raqqa, from, uh, you know, from, you know, the different aspects of all Syria. But anyway, you know, we, 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 we make the set where they understand how to work with each other and how to work with the world. And I think that's what I feel the solution is to engage the youth of the refugees in any kind of work, educational, whatever it is. Because I tell you, man, 70% of these kids, 70% of those young adults that in Jordan, Turkey, or, or Lebanon, they don't have past seventh grade education. Okay. But what, I'm, what I'm hearing Elias you say is just like for Sama took the story of the struggle and made it available to us so that we could connect with it and understand and build relationships with the characters. You're doing that not just through filmmaking, but you're using filmmaking as a tool to try and engage them in that humanization and giving them purpose and meaningful engagement in ways that, um, that, that pr provide a life for them. Not so, nice film, we also do theater, we do- I mean, Yeah, do that's one of many yeah. Yeah, yeah. tools. And it, I mean, it could be other opportunities. It's opportunity really that you're speaking about for them to- in English. Like we, the first thing we do is we teach them English because that's how they're gonna be able to communicate with the world. Great, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Dum, thank you. Um, could you can you answer? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I agree with uh, Nora and Elias actually about uh, the need uh, to document these atrocities, uh, and particularly through film documentaries. Uh, part of actually one of the things which uh, I done when I went the first time to Syria, I, I took uh, a, a friend of mine who's an independent filmmaker, and they ended up making uh, the film over there, fifty feet from Syria, about the. Uh, 
the conflict or the situation of the refugees at the border. But I think it's very important to document these atrocities or on many levels. Uh, beside that, I, I do agree that you need to involve actually the, uh, the Syrian youth, the, the refugees. I mean, you have uh, now Syrian refugees all over the world. Several years ago, I actually took a trip to Iceland. Who did I see over there? There were Syrian refugees in Iceland. So one of the things which I, I would like actually to see is to try to, to uh, start a grassroots movement by the, the Syrian youth you know, around the world to, to take this basically conflict or issue or the tragedy and to use it similar to what happened, you know, uh, during the Second World War with the genocide at that time, uh, is to try to educate people in, in these communities, in these different countries about why this matter, not necessarily just uh, uh, the conflict in Syria, but why it, it matters what happens somewhere else in the world, why we should always raise our voice to protest because these are not things which happening all the way they they affect us they affect our communities regardless of how far they are away they affect our humanity so i think we need to use this this tragedy uh to try to educate the communities and to try to bring something positive out of it thank you great so i'd like to turn um it over to tim um, DeRoche and see I see there's some questions accumulating in the Q&A. Oh, we've got a really lovely bevy of them. This Great. is the disembodied voice of Tim DeRoche, the director of programs for World Oregon. It's actually really interesting hearing you talk about youth. Uh, actually, this the first question is mine because I'm in control. Um, but um, I mean, talking about um, how we get um, messages across to people. I think, I mean, for Sama, one of the powerful things is it's moving image. It is, it is, it is family, it is mother. It's a story that we can relate to. But one of the things I've seen in the work that we've done with youth, specifically from, from MENA, you know, from Middle East and North Africa, has been the role that hip hop played. Mm. And certainly in the rise of the Arab Spring, there was a, a certain sort of lingua franca of how hip hop translated a level of resistance to protest and i'm wondering if either you know if any of you have run across you know the significance of this in 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 the camps or the or the cultures that you've interacted with yeah can i answer that one yeah okay uh, hip-hop is huge man it's funny um in beirut actually um my tattoo artist is in the hip-hop scene of beirut in the underground hip-hop scene and there was a Syrian guy, there's their poetry, they're like basically street poetry. And they go in there and they do it on YouTube and they basically, Lebanese guy basically goes against the Syrian and they're both rapping about their situation. And of course, there's a lot of friction in the youth between the Lebanese and the Syrians at this moment because of what have and have not, right? So it's really powerful. And then in the camps, um, actually, in the film, one of the films that I did, the, uh, one of the films, the Young Syrian Filmmakers, by the way, that's the name of the group, the, the Young Syrian Filmmakers the, that in Lebanon. And two of my students, by the way, to answer you, Amanda, one of them is in the UK, and now he's being educated as a filmmaker, and one is in Italy, right? So, so we started, like, you know, the doctor said, we started in Lebanon, and now because they're trapped, it, they're taking the message with them across the world, which is amazing. Um, but uh, to answer you, Tim, about hip hop, it's so huge, and especially in the camps itself, more, more than you can imagine. And they're, they're like some of them do the love stories, and some of them does about the hardship. I don't. It's hard for me to understand because they go really, really fast. But I ask them to write it, and I can read it, and it's it's really, really powerful. Um, I wish there is a more voice. I wish there is an American. Uh, hip hop artists that would, you know, you know, take under the wing some of these young kids. Actually, in the, one of the documentaries, one of the films that I did, um, there is a segment you actually see the guy doing rapping. Um, so I mean, hopefully, when people get to see that, they recognize the fact that they do have the chops. Tim, did I answer you, brother? Oh, that was that was phenomenal. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so we have a question from Janelle. How supportive are um, countries of the large numbers of Syrian refugees inside their borders mm. of what you're going through? Can you be specific which country? Um, well, you, you talked about Lebanon, we have Turkey, and like where we have seen um, large um, enclaves of refugees, is there, is there a sense of collaboration and, um, or is there, a, or, I mean, I'm, and I'm just reading one, I'm reading a question, I'm interpreting what the meaning of their question is. Is, is there a sense of um, a Mobius strip back to Syria that they've taken on people? Are they, in, are they invested in what is going on back in Syria? I mean, according to the people in the camps, uh, the youth have, don't want anything to do with Syria. Most of the youth that I met, um, and that's true for Turkey, that was true for Lebanon, for sure. I mean, the elder, the, the older, the ones who would not be taken into the army, I'm, I, I, I'll, I'll stop in a second and let you guys answer, but from what I, my experience in the camps, I've noticed a lot of the youth are not youth and have no interest because they feel that they don't want to serve an army. That was the reason why they left, right? The people who pass that age, older people, you know, they do go back. Uh, the one with little kids, they say maybe with time, but um, I didn't really, I don't see that sense of wanting to go back because of, unfortunately, that's what I saw. That's just my experience. Let's uh, give the uh, panelists a chance to adjust that if they have something. Yeah. I'm not quite, I understood uh, the question. How, uh, how are the countries where you have a large Syrian refugees involved in the conflict? Is that the question? I think the question was, if a country has taken a lot of, uh, on a lot of refugees, are they invested in what is going on back where they came from? Uh, I think to some extent, I mean, I, I can only speak about the countries I've been to, uh, I mean, Turkey is definitely pretty invested because they have the largest, I think, the largest number of Syrian refugees in, in, in the world. Uh, but also you have to take that uh, with a grain of salt. I mean, I'm pretty sure they have their own uh, uh, interests <laughs> inside Syria. Uh, I'm gonna put it politely. Uh, everybody has interests in Syria. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I. Uh, I think like the other country would probably be Germany. I think they have been very uh, proactive uh, and uh, definitely more involved than our government uh, in what's happening in Syria. Um, I, I really do not like um, how the United States in general responded to, to this uh, conflict, uh, whether it's uh, through the Obama administration or through the Trump administration. Nora, anything to add? Yeah, actually, uh, talking about uh, refugees, especially in Turkey, because I used to live in Turkey, it's something not about Syrians by themselves, because, um, yeah, mostly they, Syrians, they don't want to, like, they prefer, imagine it's um, people calling you a refugee, and you live in a camp, but also at the same time, you decide that bad circumstances is much more better much way, much way better than going back to Syria, either like to be killed or kidnapped or uh, arrested or like uh, because you don't support the regime. So you will be on the front lines, all those things. So people decide between like being a refugees or going back, they decided to be a refugees and the smuggle by uh, the sea and face all this or suffer by all those like bad ways to be refugees rather than going back to Syria. But at the end of the day, the, the, the governments who they host refugees, they have their own words. Um, because an example, Turkey, when uh, they start uh, pushing on the European Union to get more money, uh, what they did is try to play on the card of the refugees. They opened the border again to, to allow to, to refugees to smuggle to Europe. And also at the same time before that, in like short period after the, the election, and especially when they lost Istanbul, the, 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 uh, the like uh, president uh, party lost Istanbul, they start opening the gates and sending Syrians back to Syria. 
And I heard many bad stories about uh, someone because he registered in other city and his wife used to like register in different city and he used to live in the city that his wife registered in with his kids. So they took him and sent him back to Syria. Just not like he, they didn't send him back to the city that he registered in. So this man tried to smuggle many times to go back to Turkey just to see his family. And at the end of like, after he tried four or five times, he have been killed. He've been shot by the, the Turkish gendarmen. He's been killed on the border. And his family now, they don't have any support because the, the Turkish government decided to do that. But the Turkish government as a government, they don't care about those small cases. They will play it as a government. Uh, it's related to their interests. Yes, there is some humanitarian part that they are working in they care about, but also this part that they care about, it's also to protect their faces because many civilians in Turkey, they support the refugees. There is many they don't support, but there is others who they supported. And like, uh, yeah, uh, it's like, it's unclear, but at the end of the day, it's not about Syrians by themselves if they decide to go back to or not. As I told you, I was like uh, about going to back to Syria for work, but it wasn't allowed to me because the Turkish government decided that even a humanitarian worker, they are not allowed to go back to Syria or to enter to Syria. So I had to smuggle. So it was, it's like kind of complicated. Uh, it's not easy, but the, the, the big hand, it's about the governments. It's not about Syrians if they decided or not. Thank you, Nora. Um, I've got, uh, I think two more questions should take us up to the end of it. Um, I've got one from Kathleen. Hello, Kathleen Joy, woman who has run the AmeriCorps and Oregon Volunteers Program for many years. She says, I am not a Syrian or a Middle Easterner, but I still care deeply and hope and, and, and hate how the US and the world turned its back on Syrians. I am 70 years old now. I can't go to Lebanon and make a film. I can't go to a hospital to volunteer. And I feel as helpless and angry as I did in 2016. How can an older American make a difference? I can jump in and take that uh, because I've been asked that before. I mean, you, you can help in a lot of ways. I mean, you, you don't have obviously to make a movie or to be a doctor and go help the refugees over there. I would say to people is the first thing actually is really to educate yourself about the conflict and to even to educate the people around you about the conflict. That's, that's how uh, you, you actually help. You help uh, publicize what happened over there so it doesn't happen again, so it doesn't happen in other countries. Uh, to me, that, that's really the, the basic thing and it really doesn't require a whole lot of um, effort. Just educate yourself, educate the people around you, try to reach out maybe to Syrian refugees and uh, try to, to help them. That's, that's I think, the, one of the things which I would recommend. Yeah, I can, I can recommend something else. Um, it's uh, many of the Syrian kids who they um, uh, like injured because of the, the, the war, uh, they had really, uh, even if they didn't injure many kids, uh, as you saw in the movie, they lost their, their friends. Uh, they, 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 they are suffering because of the trauma of the, the seeing all this uh, blood. So like we can suggest something like uh, maybe collecting toys, used toys to send them to those kids, uh, maybe books, maybe ways to, to, to educate them by finding um, online courses or support in those small details in their lives, just to make them grow as a normal kids not, and teenagers, not only as like, uh, it's not about working in a hospital or crossing the borders or do something really big. Sometimes a small thing like try to collect some toys and send them to kids who they used to live in camps could help a lot. I, I just, first I wanna thank the lady. What was the lady's name, Tim? Uh, Kathleen. Kathleen, thank you for what she said. It's beautiful. The fact that you're watching and you're listening to what we have to say, that's powerful enough. And we thank you for that because we need more people listening to this particular struggle. 
And I, I, for me, I appreciate the fact that you are listening to that. Um, for me, I agree both with Noura and uh, Doctor, and I feel for me, um, we need to work with the youth right now because that is the future of Syria, regardless to where they live. Um, my program is one of the many programs. Support programs like that, they're working on the ground overseas. Um, you know, I agree, you know, that we don't, you know, the, the, the way how this country looked at the Syrian refugees through Trudeau administration has been just non-significant at this moment. But I think support group that you feel connected to, support the youth, and I really appreciate what Nora said about the little kids. That's what the, we do. We, I mean, I, part of the kids that I program, the, the kids that I work with, is I find the ones that needs the most help that they're not in school. And we kind of create a little program in the morning for them so they can actually assimilate back into school, right? Because some of them don't speak. Some of them have really massive trauma. Some of them like have what they call cabin fever. They've been inside of a, like us here but in a camp for seven years or their whole entire life. So yeah, I, I, there's a lot of great kids programs where you know, they buy toys and they work with kids that they are uh, um, traumatized. Anyway, so I didn't mean to take too much, but I appreciate the question and I appreciate her interest. And I, well, I also want to, I want to direct people to the Never Again Coalition um, page for the Rising Up for Human Dignity um, film festival under each, under underneath the tab for each film, there's a list of suggestions of different ways to take action, um, both you know, places to donate, ways to publicize information through your circles of um, influence, and also some creative suggestions on how, whether or not you're able to travel or whether or not you have the means to, um, to make a film or you know, do humanitarian aid. There's lots of different creative ways of getting involved and keeping the focus and the conversation going so be sure to check those out. Thanks, Amanda. You know, and um, one of the things that I remember reading at one point was there were something like upwards of 2 million young people not in school as a result of the crisis. Mm. And to think about the potential of a, you know, of a so-called lost generation mm. that is not being either in, in school or being socialized outside of you know a refugee camp it's it is alarming but each each of you brought up a really incredible relationship with syria sense of place um home um people you know smells marketplaces all of these things and like you know moving and 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 that idea of home i mean they're deeply existential things and so one of the questions that David brings up is, you know, do the majority of ref refugees, would they like to be able to return if it's possible? And if that is not the case, is there a more realistic goal to have uh, refugees, especially children and youth, plot a different course around being able to maintain Syrian culture intact where they are, and what are what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> wow, that's a that's a heavy question. I know it's it's pretty it's pretty deep, man. Sorry. I mean, can I just I'll, I'll make a simple, you know, um, it's a very complex question to see if the Syrians want to go back. It just depends um, on their age. A lot of the ones that they're teens and young adults, they've lived most of their adult life in a camp. Their relationship to Syria is within their community and their memory is kids. So um, the ones who are like seven, eight years old, that means they were born into, into uh, refugees or they were one or two years old. In, and those have zero connection to, I'm talking specifically about Lebanon and a little bit of Turkey, but I'll talk more about Lebanon little connection to Syria itself. It's like the Palestinian crisis when they were talking about, you know, the Syrian Palestinian. And he was asking his dad, am I Syrian? Am I Palestinian? Am I Lebanese? What am I? You know, because I'm, I, you call yourself Palestinian, but you are Syrian, but you're living in a, in, a, in a Lebanon in a tent. So who am I? You know, so that yeah. is a very complex question to be answered, except the fact that we, that is what I'm saying, that we need to engage the youth somehow. 
and and they, we can't bring them all to this country. Europe did phenomenal. I mean, whoever, or most of the refugees that made it to Europe and America, they're great. Their life is set, in my opinion. I mean, it's up to them how they live with it. But the ones that are stuck in their, you know, neighboring country like Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, that's a that's a tough one. You know, like I think as an as an international community, we have a, an obligation to engage the youth of that region. For me, that's just me. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very important to make a distinction between those uh, refugees who went to, to Europe or North America and those refugees who are actually stuck in camps in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. I think there are two different kind of issues. I personally, I do not think that the youth who are growing in Europe will uh, ever go back to live permanently in Syria. But I do believe that Syria as a society, uh, its salvation at this stage probably would come from those youth who are coming uh, back to visit from uh, Europe, from North America, to try actually to inject fresh idea, to inject, honestly, some live uh, life into the society. Uh, the youth who are uh, like uh, Elias said, who are stuck in, in the camps. I mean, that, that's a, a big problem because, uh, I mean, if, if you do not deal with them, they, they have like basically a generational trauma. Mm -hmm. They're gonna mm -hmm. end up at some point either being radicalized or going down into like depression. So you really need to invest uh, a lot of, uh, what do you call, money into into programs you know youth programs in these uh youth camps otherwise uh, i think uh, we will end up uh, having to pay much more in the future if, if if these kids become radicalized or disenfranchised i agree nora thoughts uh i have nothing to add here <laughs> okay you know, we are, we're coming up on the end of it. We have barely scratched the surface of an absolutely insurmountable issue. And I really, really um, thank you all for some incredible perspective. I mean, you're, you're, all three of you are coming from, you know, really, really wonderfully divergent uh, perspectives. And um, I wish we could do this for like another couple of hours. Um, but this series continues next week with I Am Rohingya. Um, I want to thank Amanda, of course, because you're on screen and I'm not. And um, uh, so the Portland State University's Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project, the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, Amnesty International USA Group 48, and the Never Again Coalition and remind folks that uh, to th thank you for being part of a program that we're about, which is called C Time C Amplified, um, which is um, all of the National uh, World Affairs Councils coming together in one week to um, figure out how we can put the world back together. I hope you can all join us next week if you, um, for anyone who didn't get a question in this week, um, watch the film next week and join the fray. So um, thank you much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists and thank you to all the participants for coming and, and uh, prioritizing this conversation. Thank you. <laughs>